So I want to speak, as we usually speak on the Pasha of the week, uh, but um, since this is also a year of Hag Hail, the year of Hag Hail, Hag means to gather together. I'm sure you know what it is, that the mitzvah in the Torah is, that the, the first year of Shemitah, last year, Toshin Samaches was a year of Shemitah, and now is that's called the year of Haghel. And the mitzvah in the theory is that on Sukkis, in, the, in that year, all Yidin should gather together, men, women, and children, in the Mizamikdosh. And, um, and the Melech, the king, would step up onto a platform, onto a raised platform, and he would read certain parshas in the Torah. And the, the effect, the purpose of this is that as a result of this reading and this participation, Yiras HaShomayim, Yiras HaShem will be imbued and implanted in the hearts of the people. I presume that. This episode, this experience, the Rambam describes, first he says that the requirement is that everyone, absolutely everyone, must attend regardless of his status in learning. He may be a big London, he knows the whole Torah, or he may be a simple, total ignoramus. Everybody has to attend. And everyone has to stand there and listen with enormous super concentration that's the way the Rambam describes it. He doesn't use the word super, so he doesn't like Kodesh, but essentially, B'yoyse, that's ex- excessive concentration and intent, to listen to what the Melech is reading. And um, explaining, in explaining the words of the Rambam, the Rebbe points out that clearly... This is not a learning session, because in terms of learning Torah, um, it's not the Melech's, it's not the Melech's function to teach Torah. Melech's function is to rule the people. Uh, to teach Torah is for the Sanhedrin, for the Chachomim. Therefore, it has entirely different, different. Um, uh, function and as we see that all people stand together whether they are uh, the greatest scholars or the simplest and they listen to the, exactly the same words and then the Ramam explains that they must sense and must regard this this uh, setting and this experience as a reliving of the Kabbalah Zatayra and Har Sinai. And that the voice that they hear from the king, this is like they hear it directly from Hashem. Just like in Har Sinai they heard Hashem's words directly to them. So too when the Melech reads the, the, the Pasha, this is like Hashem is speaking to them. And therefore they stand with tremendous, enormous um, 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 uh, attention and absorb every sound even if they know the words because all that enters into their minds into their hearts into their souls I want to discuss this briefly 
How was it? Number one, the Melech is reading it, and not Hashem. How is it that it's going to have the same effect? And how is it that, that at a completely different setting, many years later, Ayid should be able to, to relive the Maimed Hasina, which occurred in totally different circumstances and the many years before? Regarding the king, the Raman says that the king is the heart of the people, the heart of the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation, even though it consists of many Kenyirbu uh, individual people, and each person in that nation, has all his own faculties, his own brain, his own heart, and his own uh, hands and feet. And he can go and think and, 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 and do anything that he wants, regardless of where he is and what his standing is, he is always a member of the Jewish people. And there is a a um, unique type of unity, of interrelationship <clears throat> between every individual and the Jewish people as a whole. The, 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 this, this entity, what's called the Jewish people, Bnei Yisrael, as we discussed in a different time, these are a people that are not the result of a geographic, of a geographic um, location. They're not one people because they live in the same place. And today we know that it's throughout the, the period of the Golas for 2,000 years, but now it is, you can travel all over the world and you have Yidin uh, very, very different appearances, very different language, and they're all Yidin. And they all have the same Torah, and, and even though the Minhogim are very different, and the Nusach at Fila is very different, but their principle is, is the very same. It's the very same person. <clears throat> Just as in a human being, there is the brain, and there is the heart, and the heart then disseminates the life throughout the whole body. So too is it in the Jewish people as a unit. The brain which is the spark, that can be said, this is the, this is the Rebbe himself, this is the Torah, Hashem himself, this is our, our source of life. The Melech is the heart, he receives that spark from Hashem, and he disseminates it to all the people, so that all people are completely united through the Melech. Just as in a human being, the brain is the source of inspiration, the source of knowledge, and then the brain feeds and, and its, its, its knowledge to the heart, and the heart thus has inspiration and inspires the rest of the body to walk and to do and to speak and to think. The same is it true in the, in, in, in the Jewish people.
people as a whole. The Jewish people as a whole, they receive their chayus from the Melech. The Melech is the heart. And he receives his position and his inspiration from Hashem directly. The brain. Huh? The brain. The brain. And, um, and thus, just like in a person, when the heart desires something, this is really a reflection of what's in the brain. Because the brain is the inspirer, is done, that it gives, gives guidance to the heart. So to the Melech, when he speaks, it comes directly from Hashem. He is just a conduit. He speaks that which he, which he uh, received and he inspired him come directly from Matasha. And this is why it says, this is why the Amun says, that when you listen to the Melech speak, it is like Hashem, you hear Hashem himself speaking. Except it goes through the Melech. So this is the Melech aspect. And then there is the, the people aspect. I asked, how is it, how is it conceivable, how is it possible to say that a person living thousands of years after Maimed HaSinai should be able to relive an experience even from Maimed HaSinai? So the, the explanation for that is <coughs> that the Maimed Har Sinai, a time of Mahar Sinai, generally at the time when Hashem chose the Jewish people, took them out of Mitzrayim and he brought them to Har Sinai, then the Jewish people got another soul, another Neshama. This Neshama is is um, a neshama that that always and constantly relates only to Hashem. Over the years and over the, the various experiences that we go through, it is possible to get involved in worldly matters and in effect forget and not be aware of what the neshama is. But when we are reminded of it, we immediately can transplant ourselves to the real, to the real uh, uh, setting and to the real, to the reality that in fact we can relive Matan Torah, relive Hashem, telling us at Har Sinai again, again, all over again, because it is not just what happened then; it is how it affected us, and that this is our neshamas are always alert. To, to Hashem's words. And this is why the Raman says that when the Melech read these Pashis, it literally affected and imbued every Eid, regardless of his standing. Even if he is a total living Ramas, he didn't even understand what the Melech was saying. Just to hear this voice and to be present at that setting brought him, um, um, awakened something in him and brought him to a status that he knew that he relates to Hashem and he has to serve Hashem. <coughs> the Rebbe <coughs> has in effect brought back, innovated this this um, um, aspect of, of, of the year of Haghel. This was not really mentioned in the previous years, but the Rebbe started the singing and he um, was very adamant about it and very ex excited about it, if one could say, um, that this year of Haghel is a, an appropriate moment for only Eden to gather and to be reawakened to, to the union of, of Kabbalah Satoir from the Mebushim himself. 
and to be awakened to the union of Yiras Hashem in, in, a, in a very deep and um, a totally effectual, effective manner. Something that goes beyond something and just what we learn on our own. Something that we receive from Hashem, receive from the, from the Melech. By Maimed Hasina, when the Eden stood at Hasina, they were so affected by, by the Hashem's presence that they, they said to Moshe Rabbeinu, we cannot tolerate this great revelation. Because it completely imbued and, and affected them through and through. And this remained with us for all times. This is part of us. And um, the, the year of Haghil is an opportune moment to relive this, to reflect on it, and to know, just to be reminded and to understand that the fact that we are in Golos and the fact that we are spread all over does not really separate us. That really we are one people. And who unites us? Hashem Himself unites us. This is not something by our choice. It's not something... It's true, it's, it's ancestry. Avram Yitzhak Yankiv. But who defined that of the people? Because Abram had a son Yishmoel, Yitzhak had a son Esau. Who defined that this are his people? This is Hashem. So Hashem himself is the one who defined who we are, and he is the one who, he is the one who keeps us as a, as a, a united as a, as a people. So that no matter where a person is, <coughs> The primary and the first thing that he knows and remembers is not who he is personally, individually, and what his name is. He knows that he belongs, he's a member of the Jewish people. This gives him a, a different perspective on life and different perspective on the world and different strength to carry through his, his, his task that he needs to carry through. Because wherever he goes, wherever he, whatever challenges he faces, he's not facing it as an individual, he's facing it as a member of this great nation. I once explained that uh, a soldier standing in the front being shot at And he is, he is an open danger. He's standing there and he knows that there's an enemy who is going, who is shooting at him. At this time, those moments, he is required to have the presence of mind to be able to, to aim at his enemy. Because if you shoot without aiming, it's going to be a waste. You're going to be you're going to be hurt. You have to be able to be able to concentrate. And aiming, aiming requires a lot of concentration. You have to look through a little peephole and, and, and aim it very properly. And, and shoot at his enemy. Knowing full well that this, at this very moment, he is aiming at you. And maybe from more than one place. And you have to have the full presence of mind and, and do this job well. This seems to be a superhuman um, feat. How is it possible to stand in that, in that danger and face it and do your job well? Have your presence of mind and think what you're doing and do it well with wisdom, not just shoot, shoot, shoot from the hip. How is it possible? He's our only human being. So some people, I discuss it, suggest that he is doing it because he's doing it for self-protection. Because he knows that if he doesn't shoot, the other guy is going to shoot him. So I explained to them that if at this moment the soldier is thinking about himself, 
he's going to get panicky, he won't be able to do anything. If he's doing it in self-protection, he's going to lose it. That's the most dangerous thought to have at that time. What is he thinking? He's thinking that this person, this enemy over there, is not his enemy. He's an enemy of his people. He's an enemy of his country. And he's at this moment representing his country. It's completely different perception. And this gives him the strength to be able to concentrate and do his job well. And win the war. If he goes to war, and his basis for fighting the war is that he's going to be exposed to danger, and once he's exposed to danger, he has to fight back, it's not going to work. He's going to lose the war. He has to fight for, 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 for the security of his country and, his, and the people that sent him. Then he's able to do it. The same is true what we discussed now. A yid, every yid, has, is being challenged in, in the big world, and he has to do all kinds of different things. He can be under all kinds of different circumstances. And even under normal circumstances, like we speak all the time, we have the Yitzhar Hara, and we have the inclinations to do this or that, or even simple things. We don't feel like getting up in the morning, we don't feel like diving, we don't feel like learning, we don't feel like doing anything that is normal, that is not so challenging. So we have a fight with the Yitzhah Hora. And in this fight with the Yitzhah Hora, we have to always remember that it is not my per, an, an individual, my fight. It is not just, I'm fighting with Yitzhah Hora so that I be a good person. So that I am victorious and I grow. That's not enough. That's not going to give him victory. What's going to be him victory is that he is fighting for the Jewish people. He's fighting for the Yiddishkeit. With his, Yitzhah, his own Yitzhah Hora, he's fighting for the Yiddishkeit. He's fighting for, for, for the Mavish. This is how he's going to win the war. And a Yid, every individual Yid, is truly a representative of the entire people. And this is why he gets his strength. And this is what Haggai represents. To hear it from the king is, also represents that this is the heart of the people, but together with everyone, that shows that every individual Eid is really the whole people. This gives him the strength to carry out um, his task, and to, for us to carry out our own internal battles. So we're supposed to conquer each other for the sake of our, of our people in person instead mm. of our self-choosing. Mm. Bye-bye. The challenge of basically the human being have to have to do like like uh, sharing to the feeling the God is I'm sorry, what? All of these parables, the examples, basically used to, to say by your own word is to concern, is to, to defeat the animal soul, or is mm -hmm. it to control the animal soul? Yes. How could we do it? Yeah. What? How, how, how could we do it? Well, that's what I'm saying. When we recognize that we are not merely doing it for our own sake, so that I'd be a better person. For, for my security. I'm doing it because I am doing Hashem Shlichus and the Shlichus, the Shlichus, the mission in the name of Hashem I'm, and I'm doing it in the name of the whole people, of all the people, of the Jewish people. Then he has the strength to do it. Do it in Hashem. Because, because if one does it for him, for his own sake, the Yitzhah can easily come back to him and say, and say why do I care what kind of person I am? Okay, so I'm not going to get uh, a praise word, but I'm going to enjoy your life. Or whatever it's called. He has to have the strength to stand up to it. He knows that he is not 
just himself, it's not just for himself. Um, I want to speak also on the Pasha of the week, which is Pasha Hazinu, which will be read on Shabbos, even though between now and Shabbos is going to be Yom Kippur, it's going to be a completely new world then, <laughs> it seems like it, it's, it's years away, but nevertheless it is the Pasha of the week, and this is what we normally speak about. Uh, you know the Pasha of the week is Hazino Hashemayim Hazino Pasha Hazino. Moshe Rabbeinu says a shiro. A shiro. What's a shiro? A shiro means a song, a poem, essentially. And what? It's a long song. Not so long. And in the Pasha that, that Hashem says to Moshe before in the previous Pasha that this Shiro, you should write it down and you should read it to the people because this Shiro is going to guarantee that the people will remember Torah for all times. They'll never forget it. That's an amazing thing. Why a song? Why a shir? And how is that guarantee that it's not going to, going to remember it? Is this a, is a guarantee that we'll remember the Torah for? Mm-hmm. What's the guarantee that we'll remember the Torah for? The Hazino, the Shiro. Hashem said to Moshe, I'm going, I'm now into the Pasha of the week. Pasha of Hazino, which is called a Shiro. A song. Or a poem. And Hashem said to Moshe in the previous Pasha, he should write down and he should read and teach the Eden this Shira. And this will guarantee that they will always remember the Torah. The whole Torah? They will remember the principles of Torah. They remember that there is a Torah. Once they remember there is a Torah, they're going to be able to go back and, 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 learn, and learn the Torah. This guarantees that the Torah will not be forgotten, God forbid, over, you know, over the period of the Golos and all that, completely, it's never going to be forgotten. So I just want to get into it and focus in what's so special about the Shira. Hazino? Hazino and the Shira, the problem that it's a Shira. We have a whole time. And this is going to guarantee that it will not be forgotten. Is, it, is, this, is this song in a certain way, or is it just a lyric? Thing? It's a lyric, just lyric. The the um, the difference between you know a, sh- a shiro is like music. Music is, is a zemer, it's maybe an instrument, and the shiro is with the mouth or with the words. Music is also a message from the person's mind and heart. Just like when a person speaks, he tells you what he thinks. When one sings, it's also the same thing. He gives out what he thinks, what he feels. The difference between these two forms of expression is that when a person speaks, he takes the inner thoughts and the inner feelings that he has, he translates them on a different level completely, puts them into words and sentences, and he explains to you what it is that he feels. He doesn't give you the feeling itself. He gives you, he tells you about it, how he feels, what he thinks. Because that which a person really feels in his heart, it's impossible to express in words. That's beyond expression. He can talk about it, about it, but not it. Whereas in song, in the, in 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 song in Zemer, this is a direct expression of how a person feels, of what a person feels. Like like by Shafer, the blood is Shafer, 
I'm not blowing the shofar. It's a direct, it's a direct expression of how Ayid feels in his heart. A plain, a simple sound. He has a sound, he is, he is longing, and but he doesn't express what he's longing for because it's beyond expression. And this is the same Indian is in, in song. Even even if a song does have uh, variations and sounds, but basically it the, the, it goes directly from the heart into into the sound. It does not translate it into words at a different level. This is what the song is, what music is in general. And the same thing is in the Shira. Why? What's the difference? You know, the whole Torah is also written in words, and Hazinu is written in words. The difference is that Hazinu is called a Shira. It's a different form than words. Prose, the normal description of things, that's called prose. When you describe, when you express things in a in a logical and organized fashion, that things should make sense. You go from one word to the other. And everything, the, and the whole thought develops um, over a series of words, a series of sentences. This is when the thought and the feeling is translated and explained on a different level. But when you say it in a shira, it is also in words, but these words express directly the depth of your feelings. It's not translated. This is what about, about Ashira is. It comes in short sentences because every sentence is a whole message. Not a paragraph and a chapter. Every sentence is a whole message. Tehillim is, is also considered like a shira? Certain parts of Tehillim. There are different parts. Like the, the Rebbe's Kipitl is not a shira. It describes a whole, a whole thing. Okay? But, about the Hoidu, Hashem Kitoy Kiloy Rom Chazli, he's a shira. The Halim HaGor, let's go. So, um, um, and, and thus, the power of the shira is that when something is, is produced, is expressed in words, since that this is not the real thing that's felt, this is something which is translated externally to the heart, that is possible to forget. Because you learned it, and if you repeated it many times, you set it to memory, but nevertheless you can forget it. A shiro, on the other hand, is not something that you set to memory. A shiro is something that you experience. Because it goes directly to the heart. It's heart to heart. And that which you experience, you cannot forget. Because it's, it became part of you. And this is why this Shira, that's why Hashem said, may give this Shira to the Yidin, this will imbue itself into their heart, the Yidin of Torah, in such a way that it can never be lost. If you notice, I'm sure that in the Torah, the Shira's Hazimu is actually written in two columns. Like a, like a poem, like small, short, short verses. And that's a requirement. <coughs> it's not just for beauty, it's a requirement that this is how it has to be written. If Shira Zazino is written, if Shira Zazino is written in plain prose, it's a postal secret paper. What does Moshe Rabbeinu say in this Shira? Hazin Hashomayim v'adamayim v'sishma ha'oresim refi. Listen the heavens, the skies, and I will speak. 
Let the earth hear the words of my mouth. What's that mean? How is the sky going to hear my words? What is, how is the earth going to hear the words of my, of my mouth? Is it all, you know, a martial, an allegory? Or is it a dramatic dramatization? What is it? It's not a dramatization. It's words in the Torah, words of Moshe Rabbein. It's real. What's the reality of this? What does it mean the earth and the, the sky should, hear, should pay attention and the earth should hear? What is it trying to... Huh? That's important that everybody should hear what he's trying to say? What, what, is, what kind of expression is this? But the Indian is that when a person thinks in simple process of thought, the logical process of thought, in process of thought that we call prose, which means that things build up piecemeal, you know, one thing and another and another logical way, then in those circumstances, what is a person involved in is involved in his daily occupation, daily activities. I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to daven, I have to learn, I have to eat, I have to sleep. He's always identifying, he's always occupied in his thought with practical things that he's doing, limited things, things that he has to do in the immediate situation. I'm in this room, I'm in this room, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. He's not thinking, a person is not usually thinking about himself as being part of the heavens and the earth. He doesn't think of the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth just exist over there someplace. Somehow he became aware of it because it says in the Torah, but otherwise the heavens have nothing to do with me and the earth has nothing to do with me. I need to know that my cup is empty or it has water in it. I don't know anything about the heavens and the earth. Things have to be make, make sense. Things that, that, that have to have to something that I can grasp and put into perspective. So there I, I relate to things within my grasp, in my little world. But when we talk to the heart, what's doing deep down in the person's heart? What's doing deep down in the person's mind? What is the reality that one perceives in his mind, in the, in the deeper crevices of the mind, in, this, in the, what's called the subconscious? and the deeper crevices of his heart. It's a different world over there. Different world. Over there he really perceives reality. Over there, you know, things are important. For me to drink this water is very important. On the first day I drink the water. But what what is behind that? What makes it important? Deep down he perceives that what makes it important is, like we said before, because there is a bigger world that I live in. There's a bigger truth and bigger reality. And that there is Hashem who created this world. There is the Shomayim and there is the Orbits. This is what makes, what gives things a meaning. Even the smallest things. Why are the small things important? We, we relate to them. They are important. And we don't think further beyond the obvious. But deep down we realize that they are important because they are part of a greater truth. Part of the, of the total truth. Where is that expressed? 
that cannot be expressed in normal speech. That cannot be thought in normal thought. But when one is deeper and expressing what's deep down in his heart, which is expressed in the Shiva, there he t- says what's really doing deep down over there. And he says, you know what I'm, where, where I am? I'm Shemayim Baruch. Everything that I do, everything that I do, should not be judged by how it affects my immediate environment, my little corner. How does it affect the Shemayim world? How does it affect the entire existence? Because that's the reality, that's where I really, really live. The Torah says if God forbid someone kills a person we know that this is the capital sin sin of all sins Primarily for a Jewish person no. What? Not only for Jewish people? No, only for all people, but primarily for the Jewish people. There are differences. But I'll say if somebody actually kills a Jewish person, God forbid. There will happen such things. The Torah speaks about it. And, um, and um, the Torah is vengeful. You know what vengeful is? Is very, huh? Is is um, non, not forgiving, Justice. not forgiving, no matter what. And there is no excuses. There is no such thing as, as as saying, "Look, what's the difference?" Okay, this man is dead already, so why do you need to kill another yid? The Torah says, "You can, you in your mind can can say to yourself, you can overlook it, but the earth is not looking down. It cannot forget it." The earth cannot be forgiven. For the blood that was spilled in it, except by the blood of the one who spilled it. So, pause again to pray. This is like the, the capital, the Muslim, you know, the, the, the extreme case. But even on a normal, normal um, human life, you know, <coughs> The Pasik says, in associate is by Mistori Bani Loyareno. A man should hide in in a hiding place and I will not see him. What is the meaning of that Pasik? Not simply that I see him and I'm I'm a spy and I look what he say, but he, he can't fool me. That's not the point. The point is that he is actually in his little corner offending Hashem. Uh, he's insulting. As if he can. You know, he's, he's offending. He's assaulting. He's the the sin is not just am I a good person like I said before. The Shemayim orders. There's a whole creation that Hashem created, and in that creation, it's Hashem's creation and it has to be pure. It has to have. It has to have a godly spirit in it. And when there is a sin, that affects the entire creation. This is not just a private, uh, private affair for my own sake. And it cannot be just pushed under the rug. It cannot be. Because it's not a private thing. It's not affecting this person or that person, this place or that place. It affects the entire existence. Shomayim, that's what Moshe means. I've seen Hashomayim Badabayim. The Shomayim themselves are listening, are hearing what's, what's going on. Because they represent, they are the Hashem's creation. And the heavens, I'm sorry, the heavens and the earth. The sky and the earth. So all actions that we do affect the entire existence. That's right. One looks up at the sky, just to give you a little bit of a dramatization of this. Looks up and says, oh, what a beautiful sky. 
and if he sinned, then he is he is offending the beauty of the sky. It's not, not, not as beautiful anymore because because it means that that this beauty you you ignore it. And this is not just sky; it's just that it's it's it's. it's um, the godness in the world. That's what he says. In his association, he's him, if one hides in a hiding place and he thinks that I will not see him, that is the most offensive thing. It means that he is separating himself and says, I live in my own little corner. But that's not what happens. Because every breath of life is connected to the entire existence. This is what Hashem Rabbeinu says. When Hashem created the earth, the heavens and the earth, Hashem created the heavens and the earth with a purpose, with a function and a meaning. Beishis, Beizreishi, Bishil HaTayra, because of the Torah, and Bishvil Yisrael. And therefore, Yidin and the Shamayim or the Oretz are one thing. Yidin do not live in their isolated place. Just like an individual leave we spoke before is not separate from the rest of the nation. He's not he's not in isolated in his little corner where he says, This is my, mind your own business, this is my home, this is my 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 daladamas, my my room. That doesn't exist because he is in Shomai world. This is Moshe Rabbein in this Shira because it speaks straight from the heart. I say to the heart. And in the heart, one knows clearly that he does not live in isolation. And that, that he actually is a participant in the entire existence. And when he does something, the heavens themselves cry out. And the earth itself cries out. Why are you offending us? Offending Insulting. Why are you contaminating us? What contaminating means? Insulting. Huh? Insulting. Uh, contaminating means making, making impure. It's Contamination of, of, you know, bringing impurity and sickness. So, so what's... So it's it's the very existence itself and the godness in the world that demands that it be cleaned out. Yeah. I, I didn't really get it clear when you said earlier that Hashem created the the world with a purpose and what was what was that purpose actually? Torah and Yisrael. Okay. So now that we are nearing Ayim Kippur, not nearing Yimamish, Ayim Kippur, Aseres and Mitzvah, um, we have to understand that Tshuva, which means to return back to Hashem, again, this is not just the concern for the individual. The individual has to recognize himself that he is not a small pawn, he's a small person. He is everything. He is, he is a yid, and he represents the entire c- c- creation. And when he purifies himself, he is thereby purifying, bringing purity to the entire creation. The Shemaim words. The the Pasha Hazinu itself is going to be read on the Shabbos between Yom Kippur and Sukkis. Between Yom Kippur and Sukkis, there are exactly four days.
There are four days between Kippur and Sukkot. These four days are, are four days corresponding to the four letters of the Shem Havaya, Yud Ki And this, huh? Corresponding. Corresponding. What corresponding means? Yeah, yeah. And, um, um, these days are, we refer to them, but the expression is called in Gottes Nomen, in Hashem's name. Everything we do then, we do it to safeguard the, so to speak, the integrity of Hashem's name. What is this about? In these four days. Huh? In these four days. In these four days. Because what happened, huh? Integrity. Integrity means, means the, the, um, uh, truthfulness. Okay? Because Yom Kippur all even stand in the shul and daven and ask for forgiveness and they are very serious and they mean what they ask for. And then, right after Yom Kippur, they said, okay, we got what we wanted, now let's go and do our own thing. So the Sotan comes and he is, he is Mekatrik at that time. Mekatrik, he is, stands in accusatory stands and he says to Hashem, see, he didn't daven to you and they prayed because they needed something for themselves. The minute they got it, they forgot about you. You trusted them, you believed them, that they mean it, but they fooled you, in effect. They, they did it and then they go on their own way. So then, Eden, to counter that, they, they, on these four days, they occupy themselves in all kinds of different mitzvahs, right, with the sukkah, and, and generally, we try to, to, um, to be diligent, to be, be on time in davening, and so forth, in order to, to counter the argument of the Sotan, to show him, no, you're wrong. Hashem will be able to show them and see that you're wrong. Eden are coming to Shul the day after Yom Kippur, and the day after, and the day after, in these four days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot. This is like a kind of vindication of the fact that Hashem accepted the Eden and, for, and, and forget them. You know what vindication means? So, and this is, and this Shabbos is when we read Hazin on this, 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 this year. So, um, we carry over the union of Yom Kippur into the Pasha's Hazino, as we said, that, that, and, and this Shabbos we realize how, I, how each one of us, how the Jewish people as a whole and an individual, deep down recognizes that he is the, always connected with Hashem. And he cannot hide. He doesn't want to hide. And he represents the heavens and the earth. He represents the entire creation. And it matters to him that Hashem's creation should be pure and holy and whole. And whole. The Nebuchadnezzar should help, that we should, our field should be discovered and keepers, and we should come out purified, and we should come out whole, and whole and, and healthy, and strong, and then be able to carry on our task in the next year in Mr. Hashem, even the greater zest, the greater strength, the greater success, the greater bracha, and everyone should be helped in this year in everything that they need. Each one in their own way. And maximum to even a good year. <laughs> About, uh, yeah, you know what's in there? We're not going to be creating. What?